Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Byron Spooner. I'm a literary director for the Friends of the San Francisco Public Library. I am honored to welcome all of you to the inauguration of the sixth San Francisco Poet Laureate, Alejandro Murguia. San Francisco is truly a, a, a poet city. I know I see so many familiar faces out here. They're, all of you are supporters of poetry. There are many more out there who couldn't make it. Um, the people of San Francisco support poetry really like nowhere else. I want to thank you all for coming out on this afternoon and give yourself a big hand. This afternoon, we're going to hear from Jorge Molina, Jose Cuellar, Roberto Vargas. Uh, Jewel Gomez was scheduled to be here, but she's ill. Uh, we're going to hear from our city librarian, Luis Herrera. And then, of course, Alejandro will deliver his inaugural address. Uh, Friends, by the way, is selling a selection of Alejandro's books in the back of the auditorium, and I'm sure Alejandro will be glad to sign them for you. There'll be a reception immediately after this ceremony in the Latino Hispanic room directly across from this auditorium. Our first guest of the afternoon will be Jorge Molina, who will conduct the opening ceremony. Jorge is an accomplished, multifaceted musician whose ceremonies have opened all three of our international poetry festivals. You may have seen him in the movie La Mission. So please welcome the shaman of the mission, Jorge Molina. Somos todo lo bueno y a la gente. Somos todo lo bueno, somos todo lo bueno y a la gente. Somos todo lo bueno, somos todo lo bueno y a la gente. Somos todo lo bueno, somos todo lo bueno y a la gente. Life is a miracle. Love is a miracle, we are the miracle, Yana Hene. Love is a miracle, life is a miracle, we are a miracle, Yana Hene.
Forget. We maintain contact with millennia because we are a product of millennia. Each one of us present carries that magic code. We bring the message, we are the translators. We want to remain attentive of the memory of things that are passing, the tribes that slowly are disappearing, the traditions that are being obliterated by modern living. We have to be responsible. We have to keep our eyes our ears, our heart, tune in to the memory of things past. We are a very big tribe. We are the human tribe. We are not perfect. We are working through our imperfections to find the answers that will guide us to the power, not to overpower, but to share, to be part of the community. So the community is not an abstract term, but a reality. And we are all a member, contributors, also humble translators of the big message 13 billion years ago. It's really an honor to be here today to uh, honor a compadre of more than 30 years. You know, I saw my brother John Calloway, and he said to me, all the old guys are getting here together today. <laughs> and I said, it's true. But our way of passing is like we are going to refuse to be just a footnote in history. We are not going to be just a footnote in history. We are making history. Each one of us is doing that. We are working for a community, and we're working from our heart. Of course, the analytical, critical voices are always there, but the intuitive voice is the voice we must follow to be able to survive as we watch our planet being, well, you know the story. I'm not going to bore you with those details. but. We have a word in Quechua, in Peru, it's called camanque. Camanque. That means the primordial force that moves you to be alive with all your intentions. And my brother Alejandro Muguia had plenty of camanque. And we have another word, pacarisca means 
the origin, where you come from, the moment that you were manifested inside of your mother's belly as a human, that's Pacarisca. And his Pacarisca is la misión, and as he says, the mission, our mission, is the mission. <laughs> but our mission is here for all of us to celebrate a moment in life and not just let the sequence pass, but keep it in your hearts and each one of you is going to bring that contribution to your community and make it beautiful. Thank you. Frankie Cepeda, help me. My name is Jorge Molina, and I thank you very much, and let the party go. Let's hear it again for Jorge. Our next guest is Roberto Vargas. Roberto is the author of two collections of poetry, Primeros Cantos, and Nicaragua, Yo Te Canto, Balas, Besos, Y Sueños de Libertad. He is the former associate director of the Neighborhood Arts Program and former culture and labor attache for Nicaragua in Washington, D.C., and later in Beijing. Two years ago, through a city hall proclamation, he was named the honorary poet laureate of the Mission District. He is currently an organizer for the Teachers Union in San Antonio, Texas. He's come all the way from Texas to be with us this afternoon, so let's welcome Roberto Vargas. So, ¿cómo estamos? Yeah. Wow, this is uh, amazing. I just. I'm over here and I look, oh my God. Nicaragua, aquí está la Oralila, está la Beis, está Martita la Clara, está Nicaragua. Everywhere I turn, aquí está Nicaragua, like, you know, the mission seems to have some kind of roots aquí, los Nicas, ¿verdad? I wonder if the Mayan roots, that Michael Rios who began to paint up the mural for us. All the poets, oh my God, Jack, when, when I was a kid over in, North Beach, I estaba Jack taking care of me, so I was <laughs> falling to the hands of people like Alan Gilbert. Mi camarada Alan. Everybody, aquí está some of the future poet laureates. I mean, I thought you'd go, I thought I did Williams. Wow. Hasta el Chile. So, I told Alejandro that I would say a few words in terms of uh, it's, you know, what had me fascinated for the longest period of time right now uh, over the last couple of months was that whole uh, phenomena that uh, aquí in North America, people were saying that uh, you know, there was going to be the, uh, the, the, the end of the world, Benia, that the Mayans had predicted, et cetera, et cetera. You know? When all along, the Mayan culture, you know, had been one of the highest civilizations on this continent, on this world, okay, on, on, the, on the world, the planet, uh, dealing with mathematics, dealing with everything, and including all the forms of calendars that were constructed at the time, uh, this was man-made as well, but this one had one of the best, and they had broken it down into cartoons, which I won't get into because it's complicated, right? but this cartoon was coming to an end on the 21st of December right? of last year, a month and a half ago. So everybody was fascinated, all the different uh, products that were being sold. Uh, you better buy uh, tons of water because the world's coming today. Como? <laughs> the normal corporate situation were, you know, cashing in. So we say, no, wait a minute, uh, we remembered Years ago, when uh, Alejandro, all of us got involved in the, what, 71, 72, began to get involved con uh, Doctor uh, Doctor Maestro Andres Segura. 
when uh, he was in Davis, right? When, when you were, he was at UC Davis. Uh, and I won't name the gentleman who, who wrote a book, The Teachings of Como. And uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it was actually uh, Andres. It was actually Andres that he had used all of his powers and his magic and then uh, put it somewhere else and he got famous, okay. So uh, Andres came, we brought him out to the mission a number of times to stay with us up to Bernal Heights. Uh, he taught us how to use different ceremonies when we baptized my son Ariel up on the mountain with Victor Hernandez Cruz, Elias Cortez, Dr. Carrillo, all of us were up there. <laughs> 1971, walking up the mountains at the crack of dawn with, with water that we had pulled out from a secret river uh, a month before that. It was very beautiful ceremonies, but we began to really, then we did the Festival of Sesto Sol. And people said, Tan loco, what are you doing in Festival of Sesto Sol? That's like 40 years away. <laughs> we said, we know. <laughs> but if you look at the Bactoons, that's like how many thousands and millions of years ago? So 40 years ain't nada. That's right. <laughs> so we did the Festival of Sesto Sol at that time with Dr. Alegría, uh, and that was in 73, right, in Stanford, uh, here in the Mission, about Stanford, Berkeley, etc., San Francisco State. Uh, that's the kind of influences that we had at the time, and we, we, we kept them going. So this is why we wanted, and this is why you saw Jorge bringing up all that beautiful sound and, and reminding us uh, that this is not the end of the world, it's the end of an era, but it's now an age of enlightenment. And even some say that it might be the more feminist, Feminina. It's a time for our feminine selves to come out, and Kukulkan, the serpent, to come out. Okay? And that is something that we have to accept as men. So, <laughs> 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 it is. That is that, that, that this civilization will be better for it. Yeah, that we will stop all these chicken shit wars, etc. It's a new time. Ahora tenemos que buscar the age of enlightenment. Go forward yes. with each other. And then, with that said, we have Dr. Cuellar, a friend of mine, professor, I'm in San Antonio now, and I, everywhere, when I first got there, I said, do you know uh, Dr. Cuellar? I said, no, I, I missed him. He said, well, you just came to San Antonio, you just went to San Francisco. <laughs> All right, so here we meet right now. Dr. Cuellar is professor emeritus at San Francisco State University. He is the musical leader of Dr. Loco's rocking jalapeno band. It's a fusion of, uh, the fusion of uh, the borderland music, uh, style of uh, Chicano, Tejano, and, and, and uh, Louisiana style, uh, good stuff. <laughs> in 2012, he was a Hardy Curatorial Fellow at the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology at Harvard. He researched and recorded significant samples of Mesoamerican flutes, ocarinas, whistles, and rattles. He is currently uh, part of the faculty at Latino Studies at City College of San Francisco. So, please, welcome, Dr. Cuellar. Prof. Nestas. Thank you so much, all my relations. I'm really honored to be here sharing the stage with these pioneers of the Movimiento here in the Bay Area. Uh, the same thing happened when I came to the Bay Area. Everywhere I went, I heard Roberto Vargas <laughs> and his tremendous impact in bringing us together across ethnic lines, across class lines, across divisions. And I had the great fortune of meeting Alejandro and then having Alejandro recommend that there's a space right here in the Bayview that you might be able to move to. And we were kind of being kicked out of our place in the mission. In the, in the, so we found this space, and it happened to be right across the street from where Roberto Vargas' son, Ariel, who we just spoke to, have lived. And so for the last uh, 12 years, I've had the privilege of being part of the family, of the Vargas family, and it's a real privilege to finally share the stage and hear the comments and the reflections of the root paradigm of the Vargas family. And listen, you haven't heard yet everything about the Vargas family. We're going to hear generations. We have Roberto, and we have Ariel, and now we have Tonali Vargas, the next Vargas, and hasta Shelly Vargas, his granddaughter. They're going to have a great impact on the cultura here in the Bay Area because they're writers, they're dancers, they're poets, they're tremendous children, and that's, 
I'd like to thank that the next generation, looking forward to the next generation that are contributing. And before I say anything, I'd like to also uh, mention and honor the indigenous inhabitants of the space that we now occupy, the Ohlone people, who uh, we want to thank for their generosity and for continuing and persevering to today. For them and for all of you and for Alejandro and Roberto and the next generations, uh, this is an inspiration for all. Thank you so much, brother. <laughs> Next, we have a video of uh, the head city librarian, Luis Herrera, and welcoming Alejandro. Buenas tardes y bienvenidos. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm San Francisco City Librarian Luis Herrera, and thank you all for joining us today for the inaugural address of our sixth San Francisco Poet Laureate. Alejandro Murguia. I wish I could be there with you, but I'm in Seattle attending meetings at the American Library Association Conference. Nevertheless, I wanted to extend a warm virtual welcome to all of you, and especially to offer my sincere congratulations to Alejandro as he begins his term the San Francisco Poet Laureate. I'm sorry to be missing what I know will be an inspiring celebration, but I'm very proud that I had the opportunity to serve on the selection committee that recommended Alejandro to our mayor. I'm very grateful and thrilled that Mayor Lee took our advice to choose Alejandro as our city's poet laureate. Thank you to Mayor Ed Lee and to the selection committee, which included Bob Booker, Diane De Prima, Robin Ikes, Jewel Gomez, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, Forrest Hammer, Jack Hirschman, Joyce Jenkins, James Koth, Janice Marikitani, Brian Spooner, Joaquin Torres, and Oscar Villalon. Alejandro, you inspire us by your community activism as a literary organizer, an editor, a professor, and celebrated poet. I love that you describe yourself as a magical realist that lives every, everywhere in the city in all periods of time, whether it's Bertle Heights, Potrero, Bayview, The Mission, North Beach, the whole city is yours to embrace. Felicidades, Alejandro. Congratulations to you. 
You join five other illustrious laureates, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, Janice Miracatani, Devorah Major, Jack Hirschman, and Diane DePrima. You will be one of a kind, especially with your vision of making San Francisco a city of poets and engaging all of our residents to love poetry. Have a wonderful afternoon of poetry and celebration. Thank you, Luis. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we don't want to get too involved right now because we want to bring out El Gato, the poet laureate. Uh, I told him that I would say a few words. A few. <laughs> when we first met, we first did, uh, how many remember Corky Gonzalez, Rodolfo Corky Gonzalez? Yeah. Corky invited us to Denver for the first Chicano Liberation Conference. Uh, but at that time, I mean, he wasn't aware that I was a poet. We, we kind of knew about each other, but uh, when we finally got there in 69, estaba Lurista. You know, Lurista thing. <laughs> so we, we all carry a little pouches with our little poetry in the back. Uh, at any rate, after we began talking about the needs of getting together for Raza and, and uh, all of the kinds of things that we face together collectively, Tomasita, we came together. Uh, and said that we would do other greater things. That was the beginning. Uh, and then we decided to do a poetry reading together at, for the first time. That Raza poetry was, you know. Now here in San Francisco, Casa Hispana, I saw some people from Casa Hispana. We were doing some really wonderful things. Maruja, ¿dónde está Maruja? I thought, no llegado, pero ya, someone came out and said, Maruja is coming. And, and anyway, that we were already doing some real fine things here in the mission. Uh, Casispana, Milcar had really began some real interesting things with Casispana. Uh, I, I was still running around in, in the beach with these folks. But anyway, Corky, later we brought him here. Uh, at the end of that conference, this young man walks up and we, we started getting into some real radical stuff about what we were going to do. As a, then, uh, you know, there was this, somebody come up with an idea, why don't we bring dump the American flag down from the Denver courthouse and put this Mexican flag up, which you just happen to have. <laughs> so we all marched, hundreds of us marched down the street to the Denver courthouse, and Corky and all of us, the poets leading the way. And guess who climbs up the pole? This little skinny kid, 19 years old, up there, scurries, takes the flag down, puts it up there. It's Alejandro. <laughs> <laughs> and then the poets, we, uh, all of us formed a circle when the cops came. We formed a big circle around so that they couldn't, you know, they wouldn't capture him. So he comes down and we're all struggling with the police and stuff. They were astonished in 1969, you know, activists like that, poets, bringing down flags, bringing them up flags. And we said, that if you continue that, we're going to take Denver back, take Colorado back from you. <laughs> so they just said, okay, you guys get out of here. <laughs> so that was the beginning. And then after that comes all of the Tintan, the Pochoche, all the different, uh, books that we published, Nina Serrano, Malaquilla Montoya, que Raul Salinas. We started publishing because we knew at that time we were not being published, we were not being recognized, and the need for each other to communicate. So we began all those publications. Several years later, we put out this one. Does anybody remember this one? <laughs> time to Greece, Incantations from the Third World, forward by Maya Angelou, 1973. Uh, Jan Mirikitani was uh, well, myself and she were the editors, Glide Publication put it out for us. You should see the incredible lineup in here. You know, I'm looking at it, right? Ed Berlins, uh, Ishmael, Al Young, Fernando Alegria, it just goes on and on. In 73, that was the kind of vision that we had. Uh, then Alejandro went on, became the uh, director for the Cultural Center, and uh, oh, I didn't know whether I should mention, I didn't ask him about the other big thing that we did called Nicaragua. <laughs> but we decided that it was time in 71, 72 to dump Somoza. <laughs> Thus, you see that, that, that poster where he and I are coming down Mission Street with the, the Sandino flags and posters in uh, 1972. But at any rate, uh, we've always, I remember reading Valerie early in the late 60s and his visions of what poets should be and were, how he defined them, the poets that were academics and were good poets, but then the poets who were poets, not only with good poetry, but that were activists that were out there uh, making things happen, creating a new world of poetry. And then uh, let me then give you Alejandro's official biography. 
I said, oh, this is your official one. I want to talk about you, man. Okay, Alejandro, Mar <laughs> Alejandro Murguilla is the author of Southern Front and This War Called Love. They're both winners of the American Book Award. He has a book of nonfiction called The Medicine of Memory, which highlights the mission district in the 70s during the Nicaraguan Solidarity Movement. Founding member and first director of Mission Cultural Center, uh, one of the founders of the Rocket Dalton Culture Brigade, and co-editor of Volcan, Poetry from Central America. He's currently a professor at the Latina and uh, Latino Studies at San Francisco State, author of a short story called The Other Barrio, which has first appeared in an anthology of San Francisco Noir, and has re recently filmed in the streets of Mission District. Now, in poetry, he has published spare poems, and this year, a new collection called Native Tongue. And as mentioned, he is the sixth San Francisco Poet Laureate, the first Latino poet to hold the position. Orale, gato. <laughs> Thank you, so here we go, compadre gato. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. What a joy and pleasure and honor to be here with you today. It's especially, I think, uh, for all of us, so important to be able to gather as community to celebrate, community to celebrate poetry, to celebrate literacy, to celebrate literature, especially when so much of the world is racked with chaos and violence and intolerance and prejudice and war. So thank you very much for coming today. <clears throat> Let me tell you a story. Although, although I am born in California, I'm raised in Mexico City in Tijuana from the time I'm, a, I'm about uh, one, year, one years old till I'm about um, six years old. And um, it is in Tijuana, when I'm about five years old in the first grade, that I first recite poetry. I, I am picked to, to recite from memory this poem uh, for Columbus Day, of all things. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, yeah, and ironic, right? And so uh, I'm five years old, and I'm on this balcony, and, uh, and I recite this poem. And um, a few months after that, actually a couple of weeks after that, uh, we come, return to the United States. But I come back not knowing one word of English, not knowing anything at all about the culture. And so for many months after that, uh, I am silent. And even now, today, I vividly recall the moment I spoke my very first words in English. Pepsi, please. <laughs> oh, I was so happy I could finally communicate. And uh, it's, it's been uh, a long road from that balcony and a five-year-old to this stage. And uh, before I go any further, I want to thank uh, Magali and Marisol for their patience, <laughs> especially their patience. I, I knew I was supposed to do something up here. But folks, let me be honest. I am absolutely under no illusion, because I know better than anyone in this room, that this honor is not about me as an individual, but rather that it is an honor that goes to my entire community. <clears throat> and, and I also know perhaps better than anyone, that there would have been other poets here as poet laureates way before me had fate perhaps not interfered. And I want to mention them right now. I'm talking about 
the fine Filipino poet Serafine Sequia, the African-American poet Brio Clay II, and another uh, Filipino-American poet, Al Robles. <laughs> they were all colleagues of mine. <coughs> and also, I want to mention other poets that would have been poet laureates, I think, had uh, the Calavera Catrina not taken them out the dance. And I'm talking about uh, Victor Martinez in particular. <coughs> and also, though he was not a poet, um, he did work in San Francisco. I heard him and met him several times in San Francisco. I also uh, want to honor P.D. Tomas uh, <laughs> and his, um, his uh, slogan that I think about every day, every poet a child and every child a poet. <coughs> and also let me mention, because they are part of the parallel literary histories that I want to talk about today, uh, other poets that I grew up with that had great influence on me and that also would have been poet laureates, I think, but Fate took him to other places and other cities. And I want to mention Victor Hernandez Cruz, and Tazaki Shange, Jessica Hagedorn. These are writers that I grew up with, right? I learned to read and write uh, in public and personally with them and was inspired and encouraged by their words and their own work. But in particular, uh, I want to acknowledge the one that would have been the first Latino poet laureate of San Francisco, and that is Roberto Vargas. <laughs> Had, had not war, revolution, and life gotten in the way, he would have been here instead. <clears throat> uh, and I, I tell you, you know, um, during that period when I'm 18, 19, 20 years old, 21, 22 in San Francisco for the first time, and I'm meeting some of these writers, and I'm learning my first chops in places like uh, the cafe coffee gallery uh, on Grant when Carol Lee Sanchez was running it, and also the Riveltad Borden, where I met people like John Ross, Kel Robertson, Wayne Miller, and George Songas. These were the people that I grew up with that taught me um, how to be a poet in San Francisco, and I want to thank them. And also I want to point out that I learned to read in San Francisco in working men bars in working men cafes. And if your poetry wasn't good or if you were kind of sloppy or weak, they'd get up there and tell you, sit down, man. <laughs> and I always like to say that the first time I ever got paid was at the River Tad Borden, and it was two beers. But, I, but actually it was only one, because the other one was thrown at me. <laughs> so, when I, so when I talk about community, I, I mean all of us, all of us, regardless because the word community means those things that we have in common, right? We also get the word communion from community, yes? So these are the things that uh, we hold in common, our poetry, our literature, and our hi literary history. So when Mayor Ed Lee called me and asked me, asked me very graciously if I would be the next poet laureate, I told him I would accept, but only in the name of my community. Oh. And then the second thing I asked was, um, does this come with a parking permit? <laughs> you have no idea how many poems I've written on the back of parking tickets. <laughs> <laughs> and that stipend you've heard cheese me about, that's going to pay parking tickets. <laughs> so San Francisco has, in fact, many parallel histories, meaning histories that run concurrently, right? And one of those histories is the history that I trace for myself, which is the history that has often been lost, but at the same time preserved. For example, the history of the Ramaytush, the First Nation people, that lived in the Mission District along the creeks, Mission Creek, Presida Creek, Islaeus, Serpentine Creek, and their first chants, which are in fact the first songs and the first poetry of San Francisco. And here's one from the Ramay Tush. Ishman Kolma, Karak Yonabi, Asho Isha, Hacheche Ashmush, Harwek Irsha. Sun, moon, sky, village, friend alive, we eat, drink, sing, and dance. Or also the Diaries of Discovery, 
written by people like Pedro Font, who comes with the first expedition uh, in San Francisco, and he's the very first one who cites and describes the Farallon Islands. And he also mentions in his diary a place over there by uh, Point Reyes, but he names it Punto Murguia. <laughs> yeah. And what about the Chileans? Those Chilenos that shipped here from the Southern Hemisphere in the 1840s, right? Bringing the old mining songs and settling in communities like what is now North Beach, the original Latino barrio, right? Uh, when I first came to San Francisco, there were still great remnants of that. Sandino Photoshop, La Sinaloa Cafe, and even now we still have uh, the Church of La Virgen de Guadalupe. And the songs and yearnings of Latin America transposed and fused to this landscape. Pablo Neruda, for example, writing his play, Fulgor y Muerte de Joaquin Murieta, <laughs> Splendor and Death of Joaquin Murieta. So Latin America fused to the history of San Francisco and vice versa. San Francisco fused to the history of Latin America. I think it's time for a poem. This one comes from the archives. It's one of the very, very first poems I wrote uh, when I was in San Francisco, and I wrote it in that little mini park there. I think it's now called Dalioto Park uh, off of Cap Street, and I think around 19th. I wrote this poem there, and, it's, and I'm going to read it in the language of my barrio, which is Caló, and I lo voy a leer así porque, porque me da la chingada gana. <laughs> California. Se fueron por el camino real, ese largo y triste camino de eucaliptos cargados con frijol y maíz y llegaron en Lower Down Chevy Ramflas con gafas, fileros and talking about the high life, tomando botellas de tequila que decían made in Mexico, <laughs> hablando tres palabras de inglés apple pie y coffee y cantando vámonos a California vámonos a California se iban por el alambre indios de calzón blanco y barache y aterrizaban pochos, pachucos perdidos vatos locos con tatuajes mágicos de vida y muerte esperando en las esquinas el big hit the five and ten of Caliente race track that never came. Cabuleando, esta sí es la vida gacha, cucaracha. <laughs> and singing, vámonos a California, vámonos a California. And they came from New York, the Big Apple, to the Big Orange. <laughs> Yorubas, jíbaros, borinqueños, piel color café oscuro, ojos de verde cocodrilo y un catatún tun tun, catatún tun tun, de viejas selvas ancestrales, but now with a pocket full of canceled tickets to the promised land, they were singing. Vámonos, vámonos, vámonos a California. And early in the 20th century, a young Nicara Nicaraguan poet, Jose Coronel Urtecho, came and lived in San Francisco, there on Van Ness Avenue near Green Street, and wrote about what it was like then to be a young foreign student, a young Nicaraguan in the city. And he titled his essay, Mis Gay Twenties. But he didn't mean gay the way we mean gay, right? He, he just meant he was very happy here. But on his return to Nicaragua, with his suitcase stuffed with the poems of Walt Whitman, Ezra Pound, Carl Sandburg, Edna St. Vincent Millay, and many other modernist poets, his influence would revolutionize the poetry of his native land. And from this poetic interchange, the, great is the greatest literary movement, I think, of the Americas emerged, the vanguard movement of Nicaragua, 
which produced such diverse poets, such as Pablo Antonio Cuadra and Ernesto Cardenal, the greatest living poet right now of Latin America. But, but also, the influence of Central American literature, for example, on the literature and the poetry of San Francisco cannot be underestimated. In particular, the poetry of poets like Claribel Alegría, Daisy Zamora, Giaconda Belli, Ernesto Cardenal, and in particular, I think, Roque Dalton, yeah. whose work and life inspires, I think, so many of us in this room and was also the inspiration for the formation of the Roque Dalton Cultural Brigade, that tremendous group of poets and translators that produced the first anthology of Central American poetry, Volcan, translated uh, by the members of the brigade and co-edited by Barbara Paschke, uh, Poemas Clandestinos, translated by Jack Hirschman, and Tomorrow Triumphant, the selected poems of Otto René Castillo, co-edited by David Volpandesta and uh, Magali Fernandez. And I think that's part of the work that I am most proud of, the work of the Roque Dalton Culture Brigade, because I believe very strongly that it is also the duty of the poet to recover the lost text of our continent, the forgotten stories and writers, and to reread them and preserve their work and reintroduce them to a contemporary uh, audience. And it is important also to read widely from many different streams of poetry, even bad poetry, so that you know what good poetry sounds like. <laughs> And then, I don't think I'm too far-fetched in saying that during the 60s and 70s, the literary history of San Francisco was in the Mission District, right? Uh, pushed and promoted very much by uh, Dr. Fernando Alegria, professor at Stanford and cultural ambassador for the Allende government, who did so much to link Latin America to San Francisco, and in particular, uh, to one of the most momentous momentous readings ever, October 4th, 1973, at Clyde Memorial Church, the reading in solidarity for Pablo Neruda and Salvador Allende, uh, attended by some of the great poets of our time, including Diane de Prima, previous poet laureate, Victor Hernandez Cruz, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, the first poet laureate, Janice Mary Catani, the second poet laureate, Shane Franco, Kathleen Fraser, David Henderson, Ishmael Reed, Nanos Valoritis, Nina Serrano, to name a few, just to give you uh, uh, insight into the broad range of poets and voices that we brought together uh, during those decades. And also, I say it was the literary history of San Francisco, the Mission District, because we had such also incredible amount of publications uh, like Tintan Magazine, La Gaceta Sandinista, El Pulgarcito, El Tecolote, and we had, uh, even now, continued to have Floricanto en el Barrio, sponsored by the Friends of the Public Library, Floricanto en la Misión, uh, another Floricanto en el Barrio in July uh, 2011. And uh, this fruition, this bursting of energy in the Mission District could not have happened without the solidarity and support of the rest of the San Francisco community. And so, uh, the truth is that we have never left San Francisco, right? We have just been left out. But from now on, from this stage, I say that now all these currents, the indigenous, the African American, the Asian American, the Latino American, the Anglo American, the beats, the non beats, right? Uh, the mission poets, all the poets from now on, we all sing the song of our times and our place here in this beautiful city of poets. So after today, we will no longer speak of parallel literary histories, but of literary history in the heritage, heritage of San Francisco, punto final. <laughs> I know a lot of you have heard me say that I have been accused of being a poet, and, and they're right, I'm, I'm a stepping razor. <laughs> but the very first time I was accused of that, well, let me read you the poem. 
The poet recalls his first reading. <laughs> Riding home from celebrating my first book, Compadre Riding Shotgun, our lids heavy with poems and tequila, and beat up sports car crawling towards Bernal Heights, dawn a spider with a thousand legs of light, a black and white flashing triple strobes, angry at Latinos riding around this hour of the morning instead of heading to work, pulled us over. Compadre and I exchanged glass glances as other encounters with belly clubs, handcuffs, broken ribs surfaced from our suddenly awake memories. Without my license, nor proof of birth, I proved my name by reciting a poem while badge number 8601 dug my rhymes and followed along in my proud book. Then 8601 returned to patrol car while I winked at compadre thinking, we're cool with the heat. So I never saw old 8601 slide up my window like a snake and put the 357 Magnum to my temple, the barrel cold as a pinpoint of ice. The gun trembled in his hand and his words pressed through lips tighter than a chicken butt. You've a red warrant. Move and I'll blow your fucking head off. I slanted my eyes at him and replied, be cool, I'm not that bad a poet. <laughs> True story. Here's another poem about a poet who perhaps was not as lucky as I was. Uh, and I'm talking about perhaps the greatest poet of the 20th century, at least in Spanish, uh, Federico Garcia Lorca, <laughs> who was assassinated uh, by the fascist forces at the start of the Spanish Civil War because he's a poet, because he's a playwright, because he's progressive, because he's queer, and his body dumped in an unmarked grave and even today, the greatest poet of his time, we don't know exactly where his bones rest. <coughs> Lorca's dream. They tell me that your clavicle is a star over Andalusia, that your melancholic metacarpals still clutch a clod of earth in Sevilla, that your hips have not ceased dancing in La Habana like in Nueva York, the jasmines bloom in your eye sockets, and every petal a poem, that your jawbone is the voice of all the silenced ones, the undocumented ones, the deported ones, those insulted and executed, that the moon cradles your bones, Federico, fragile as hummingbird wings. That's what I was told one silvery night by the hip red ants that sleep in your cranium. <clears throat> now, the nice thing about this poem, but please don't try this at home with your own poem is that with a few quick origami folds, Lorca's dream turns into a paper airplane, and then the dream flies off. <laughs> Nice sketch, John. <laughs> I just thought I'd try something different. Uh, yes. 
Eh, que, que no lo traigo en español. ¿Lo traes en español? Bueno, lo voy a leer en español. No está aquí. I was going to read one in Spanish a little bit later on, but I guess we can do it now. <coughs> El sueño de Lorca, because I actually wrote this originally in Spanish. Me cuentan que tu clavícula es una estrella sobre Andalucía, que tus melancólicos metacarpianos aún aprietan un terrón de Sevilla, que tus caderas jamás han cesado de gozar así en La Habana como en New York y que las cuencas de tus ojos han brotado jazmines y cada pétalo un poema, que tu quijada es la voz de todos los sospechosos, los desgraciados, los desportados, los insultados, los fusilados, y que la luna arrulla tus huesos, Federico, frágiles como alas de colibrí. Así me lo contaron una noche plateada las hormiguitas rojas que duermen. En tu cráneo. You know, I, I come to poetry out of necessity in a way, right? Out of an urgent need to define who I am, but also as a way to give voice to, to my community. To me, poetry should be read out loud. And I encourage all of you to read a poem to a friend and have a friend read a poem to you. To me, poetry is how I stay alive, how I navigate the dark hours of the night. My poetry is an impure poetry. I hope that is, it is a poetry that is accessible and that you don't need a professor of literary theory to deconstruct it for you. <laughs> In fact, in, in fact, I think my poetry resists the construction. <laughs> or as uh, my friend said the other day, uh, there isn't one extra word in it. Because poetry, after all, as the poet once said, is the best word in the best place. My work is at times bilingual or multilingual, and sometimes doesn't give a lingual <laughs> or lengua how it expresses itself as long as it remains true to the word as Eduardo Galeano says and to paraphrase Galeano one more time to think that poetry can change the world is absurd <laughs> but to think that the world can be changed without poetry is equally absurd. For me though, poetry is also prophecy. Language fused the prophecy, that's poetry. So if you permit me, I'll make a prophecy. And let's call this the prophecy of the Poet Laureate. And like all prophecies, it has to do with language. And the language that I'm concerned about right now is this question of this so-called immigration reform. Let me just gently point out that the 12 million Latinos in this country are neither illegal nor undocumented. <laughs> but, but, rather, but rather refugees. Refugees from the chaos, military, political, and economic chaos of Latin America caused in large part by U.S. foreign policy. Yeah. And the most recent example is the House of Honduras, burned down a couple years ago by our current administrator, President Hillary Clinton, etc. And since that coup, a couple of years ago, Honduras has become the most violent country in the face of the earth. More violent deaths per thousand than Iraq, than Afghanistan, than Pakistan, than West Oakland, than La Mission. Yeah? And so the prophecy is this. It doesn't matter how high, how wide, how long you built that fence, 
as long as you keep burning down the houses of Latin America, those refugees are going to fly over that fence. So now that I got that off my chest, I think it's time for a love poem. Not all my poems are angry. Esta la voy a leer en español porque la escribí en español. Y, and if you're linguistically challenged, I just said I'm going to read this in Spanish because I wrote it in Spanish. <coughs> but all these poems are available in native tongue. If they're written in Spanish, they have the translation in English. If they're written in English, they just stay in English. <coughs> this is for Magali y se llama. Aquí, con tu memoria. Bravo. <laughs> ah, ya, ya sabes esta. <laughs> Hoy me senté pensativo, mirando al mar, atado como prisionero, a otro día, enroscado, hecho caracol por todo fecundo que eres en esta tierra y este mar. El chillido de las gaviotas, las nubes como reflexión del agua, el cielo como tu caricia ese día de junio de cual ha quedado solo este momento. Estos segundos donde surges otra vez del mar, Tu traje de baño, silueta de pura espuma, espléndida, joven, sirena de brazos bronceados, pelo color de arena quemada, mujer hecha de embrujos, de flores acuáticas, de tierra, montaña, hierbas, que ahora son poema, porque estuvimos juntos esa tarde y los dos fuimos hechos de calendarios donde se retornan siempre los días con sus mismos destinos, los mismos amores y enemigos de siempre. Solo tú y yo quedamos porque fuimos chorro de agua, música, el rubí de, de un beso cayendo hacia el fondo de un pozo donde a través de los años nos miramos como éramos aquel día, pobres y enamorados de todo el mundo. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, you're very kind. In, in the old days, this would have been a bottle of tequila, right? In my bad days. <coughs> But to make up for that, I have a tequila song. <clears throat> if you drink enough tequila, you will become an honorary Mexican. <laughs> and may be stopped for identification. <laughs> but you know what I always say? Everybody, everybody is either a little bit Jewish or a little bit Mexican. <laughs> this one's for my friends, Jack and Aggie, who have been great supporters of me. Uh, and for all my friends. A poem for my hat. Today, I want to wear a hat. Step out on my porch in a friendly floppy one and wave hello to the world. Or maybe a mysterious fedora, brim down low, investigate the missing brown buffalo. Perhaps a Greek fisherman's hat, a song to the briny deep, the sirens and mermaids at my shoulder rocking me. Oh, a big old Mexican sombrero would do with silver threads along the brim that would hurt because of you. A tropical white Panama woven by hundred-year-old hands with a parrot feather on the band and I'll dance some slick mambos. I could sport a crazy cat hat with balloons and milagritos on the crown and stroll down Mission Street 
leading a lobster on a leash. <laughs> I could style a brown beret, cocked over angry eyebrow, and shout, power to the people, and other slogans I forget. <laughs> Maybe I'll try a cloud with a blue ribbon tied around it like a song, or none of that. Today, I'm going to wear the sky as my hat. And then, I'll pass it on to you, so you can wear it too. So, um, I want to mention briefly some of the projects uh, that I would like to do as the Poet Laureate because the Poet Laureateship in fact belongs to all of you and so the Poet Laureate is in fact yourselves. You are the Poet Laureates. Um, very general terms, right, I would like to initiate a campaign. I've talked to a lot of people already. A lot of people have approached me with projects, ideas, all of them beautiful, all of, all of them wonderful. I encourage all of you to pick up the batuta, the baton, and you run with it, yeah? I'm only one person, but as a community, we're very large. And so s these are some of the projects uh, that have uh, come to me and that I've encouraged to go forward, uh, naming, for example, San Francisco as the city of poets would be nice. Um, poetry festivals for young people, 14 and under. More uh, Floricanto festivals, right? Uh, poetry in public places. We would like to initiate a campaign of poetry in bus stops, on walls, on the steps of North Beach, murals, everywhere that people congregate. We would also, I, I have big dreams sometimes. We'd like to have poetry workshops in all levels of government, right? <laughs> Beginning with the Board of Supervisors, <laughs> right? That, that, that the politicians in our city learn to be true to the word, right? Uh, to speak it truthfully and uh, honestly, and that maybe perhaps in the future, the mayor and the, our elected officials will also be judged by the beauty of their haikus, right? <laughs> by the wit of their epigrams. Uh, and so uh, these are some of the projects I would like, but also I want to mention, I don't know if some of you before the event opened the doors, if you saw uh, a man out there in the lobby, this big, huge, brown buffalo of a man hanging out there, I got a chance to say hello to him. That was Oscar said that goes to the brown buffalo. He's been on his brown buffalo run for a while. Hey, Oscar, man, you're going to stick around. He's on the, on the run. I think he was headed over to um, 16th and Valencia, where uh, the other project that I want to um, create is uh, a series of plaques to honor literary events and literary figures throughout San Francisco. And I would like to start at the Hotel Royan, the mission's finest, where, where Oscar Seta Acosta wrote one of the great novels of United States literature. And I'm talking about the revolt of the cockroach people. <laughs> and this poem begins by invoking three poets from that neighborhood, and the poem is called 16th and Valencia. I saw Jack Michelin on the corner of 16th and Valencia reciting skinny dynamite, and he was angry. And the next day, he was dead on the last BART train to Concord, and maybe that's why he was angry. <laughs> I met Harold Norris shuffling around in a beaten world, his pockets stuffed with poems only hipsters read. It's a cesspool out here, he sighed, before returning to his room in the Albion Hotel, where angels honeycomb the walls with dreams, and the rent is paid with angry poems. 
And I heard Oscar, Zeta, Acosta's brown buffalo footsteps pounding the Valencia corridor. And he was shouting poetry at the sick junkies nodding with their wasted whores in the lobby of the Hotel Royanne, the mission's finest. And even the furniture was angry. <laughs> and I joined the waiters at the bus stop the waitresses, the Norteño trios, the flower sellers, the blind guitarists wailing boleros at a purple sky, the shirtless vagrant vagabond ranting at a parking meter, the spray paint visionary setting fire to the word, and I knew this was the last call. We were tired of living from the scraps of others. We were tired of dying for our own chunk of nothing. And I saw this barrio as a freight train, a crazy Mexican bus careening out of control, a mutiny aboard a battleship, and every porthole filled with anger. And we were going to stay angry. And we were not leaving, not ever leaving. El corazón del corazón de la misión. El camino real ends here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're so, so kind and generous. Byron says not to applaud, but to throw money at the library. <laughs> but, I'm the, but I'm the poet laureate, not just of the mission, not just of the Latino community, the Bayview, the, the Bernal Heights, the Outer Mission, but of the entire city. And I embrace its, all its poetic traditions and its history, and they have influenced me so much. And one of those poets that influenced me when I was still uh, very young was uh, the African-American poet author of Golden Sardine and Ancient Rain, one of the great figures, I think, and a forgotten figure, I think, of the literary history of uh, San Francisco. And I'm talking, of course, about Bob Kaufman. Yeah. And I was fortunate enough to meet him several times. Uh, once during that period when he had taken a vow of silence, a Buddhist vow of silence, for 10 years in protest to the Vietnam War. And I know a lot of politicians I wish would take a 10-year <laughs> bow of silence. <clears throat> <laughs> the eyes of the poem, the eyes of the poet for Bob Kaufman. Corrugated iron panels stamped on your forehead your eyes, two pennies rattling in a blind man's cup. Yet once, the sharpest beat on the scene of New York tenement parties, and later, tales of Tangiers, white slavery, and phetamine dreams, snow in August, jazz, jazz on your breakfast plate, and jailhouse riffs etched with a silver razor and somehow a busted nose and then named Prince of Poetry, a black rim bow sailing a bamboo raft into exile and silence, a baby Buddha perched on your shoulders blowing a saxophone dirge down your river Nile. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. I, I hope, I hope these poems don't get me in trouble with the American Taliban religious military industrial big pharma complex. <laughs> yes, but if I don't show up for class one day, you know where I'm going to be? I'm going to be in Cuba. And, you know, beautiful tropical island, beautiful people everywhere, beautiful music, and that's going to be the good part. 
The bad part, of course, is that it's going to be in Guantanamo. <laughs> <laughs> so if I don't show up for class one day, please contact your local representative. <laughs> and I also want to acknowledge, I think, as part of the influence of the Latino community, uh, the Rocket Dalton Culture Brigade and the influence I think it has had in, in at least the spirit of the Revolutionary Poets Brigade uh, and the Occupy Anthology. I want to acknowledge them. Uh, I, I think uh, the RPB has uh, taken poetry uh, from a passive art to an active art, and I totally acknowledge their contribution to the literary history of San Francisco. <laughs> uh, before um, I close my set, uh, I would um, like to, to offer uh, thanks to some people that have been very important in uh, the reason why I'm standing here uh, this afternoon. Uh, I want to thank very sincerely and humbly uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, Jack Hirschman, Agneta Falk, uh, Nancy Peters at City Lights, and also Elaine Katzenberger, Peter, Stacy, Paul, uh, everyone at City Lights for their support. Uh, Jose Cuellar and Jorge Molina and the Pena, Pena Govea family. Uh, my colleagues at San Francisco State. My friend, uh, the late Honduran poet who first turned me on to Lorca and Cesar Vallejo. My Honduran poet friend, Walter Martinez. I want to thank Donna Barrow. I want to thank Daniel Del Solar from Quintan Magazine. <laughs> Daniel Presente, <coughs> Jorge Argueta and Luna's Press, uh, Randy Finglin and Cece Marimbo Press, uh, Meredith May, who wrote that story in the Chronicle the other day, uh, uh, Byron Spooner and the friends of the San Francisco Public Library. In particular, I want to thank Joan Jasper and Michelle Jeffers for their incredible work in organizing this event and also Kimberly and Michael Escamilla from the International Poetry Library who are filming this event. Uh, the nomination committee and Mayor Ed Lee for taking the risk in the year of the dragon, right? <laughs> Luis Herrera, the city librarian. Uh, my sister, Libier, and brother-in-law, Tom, who came up from LA. My compadre, Roberto Vargas. Uh, my late brother, Raymond, who uh, first turned me on to banned books. Uh, and of course, again, uh, Magali and Marisol and all my relations and all of you. Thank you very much uh, for supporting poetry and literature. To, to, that's, that's next year. We're still in the year of the dragon. To, and to follow in the footsteps of uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, the grandfather of all the poets, I think, in San Francisco, uh, Janice Mary Catani, probably the finest Asian-American poet, uh, Deborah Major, the voice of the African-American community, Jack Hirschman and the Arcanes, and of course, Diane De Prima and the Revolutionary uh, Letters. Uh, it is a heavy uh, load to take. To follow in their footsteps, I am absolutely humbled and honored and proud to serve you as your next Poet Laureate. I'm, I'm going to do one more poem. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, thank you, Juan Pablo. At, at least it wasn't a beer. <laughs> and as San Francisco, the poetic beating heart of our continent in the continental sense dreamed by Jose Martí, I would propose that from now on we adopt the most honorable address to a federal citizen of San Francisco, the City of Poets of the Americas, not doctor, not esquire, not mayor, not supervisor, but the most honorific and respectful way to address a fellow human being. Poeta. I would like to now have joined me on stage for my last number, my colleague and friend, Dr. Jose Cuellar. Dr. Loco to you.
And never forget this. San Francisco is a city of poets. Therefore, each and every one of you is a poet until proven otherwise. <laughs> Now, uh, I never met Ernesto Che Guevara, but when I was a young brown buffalo, one time in Cuba with the Venceremos Brigade, we marched two days, Montaña Adentro, into the Escambray Mountains to where Che had had his headquarters during the Revolutionary War. And I saw where he worked, the tiny desk, two by fours nailed together, and the very simple cot where he slept. And that night we built a big fogata, a big bonfire. It was the anniversary of Che's death, and a man came to speak to us by the name of Harry Villegas. And his nom de guerre is Pombo. And Pombo had been with Che in the Congo and in Bolivia. And when Che's group had been surrounded, Pombo and a handful of others had been able to break the blockade and reach Chile, where they were welcomed by then Senator Salvador Allende, who helped Pombo through a very circuitous route get back to Cuba, and then Cuba came, and then Pombo came to our camp and told us that night what it was like to be with Che Bolivia. So, although I never met Ernesto Che Guevara, I did meet Pombo, a man of Che's guerrilla. This is called, There is no Santos on my altar. Sometimes I wonder, Che, if you ever grew tired of being up on the altar, if you ever grew weary of being the new man, el hombre nuevo, didn't you ever miss just being Che again, the one with a girlfriend that abandoned you when you rode the Norton 500 across the Andes like a crazy beat? Whatever happened? to that frustrated poet who instead became a revolutionary who wished he'd been a poet and at the risk of sounding ridiculous was a poet. Didn't you ever miss a tango by Piazzolla in that faded blue light of Buenos Aires when drunken love songs filled the porteño barrios? Or was it all tactics? strategy, central committee, the rhetoric of politics, a mouthful even for a poet. Your diary in Bolivia is smeared with mud and shit, but it is also stained with hope. You made your share of mistakes. You forgot, god damn it, the necessity to tango. You failed to read the garden of forking paths. You were right about love and revolution and wrong about most everything else. In other words, you were human. Comandante, 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 comandante. So tonight, another anniversary of your death. I'm sure somewhere, someplace in Cuba, the Congo, Vietnam, Chiapas, or maybe just right here at the Civic Center. A hungry bastard with nothing but hope in his gut will light a candle at your portrait. And surely you know it would have to be that one with a red star on your beret. Your eyes staring with nostalgia at the future. But Che, 
I have no santos on my altar, no idols, no gods, no goddesses, only flower petals and hummingbird feathers. So instead of a candle, I'll play you a tango. One that starts with a ráfaga of pandonion, like the roar of a motorcycle, and with my canteen that survived the Southern Front in Nicaragua back in 1979, I'll tip you a toast. Hombre a hombre. Amor, vino y revolución. Che, comandante, presente. Y aquí se queda la clara, la entrañable transparencia de tu querida presencia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dimitri and Gemma. Thank you, Barbara and David. Thank you all very much. Roberto Vargas. <laughs> Dr. Loco, Dr. Jose Cuellar. Jorge Molina. Los <laughs> Laureles. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all very much. Thank you all very much. Never forget that you are a poet until proven otherwise. Yeah. Thank you all very much.